This week, we're celebrating the Flames' four-game win streak at home, assessing the coaching staff at the midpoint of the year, and breaking down Brian Burke's recent comments to the media. We'll also talk about how the team's getting bigger this season, and looking at some of the players in Abbotsford we think will be brought up to the big roster before the end of the year. This is Fireside Chat, episode 37. Four in a row! Recorded January 30th, 2014. Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. We're just moments after the Calgary-San Jose game and that sweet 4-1 win that put Calgary on a four-game winning streak. It's Dan, and we're back with Matt. How you doing, Matt? Very good. Enjoy that game tonight? Best effort I've seen in a long time. I think that's the best goaltending effort we've seen since Kippersoff wore the Flames jersey last year. Can't argue with that. Ramo's starting to look like a decent stopgap number one starter. I th- I know at the beginning of the year we th- we all had high hopes for Ramo, and he really kind of disappointed, and I think that's why they brought uh, Rito up. But I think that Ramo's risen to the challenge, if you will, quite well. And he's starting to look like a, you know, he's starting to look like the goalie that Feaster was promising that he would be. Don't you agree? Yeah, and the, that's the thing with goalies: you can never really tell uh, until you're like six months to a year, and you know, into them being on your team. Like Red Obera, when he came up, he was doing very good, and now he's kind of trending the other way, and Ramos. You know, he was looking bad at the start, and now he's looking like a legitimate NHL starting goalie. So, you know, it's good that they've been patient. Yeah, I think coming into this season, we all thought that this starting job for the Flames this year was um, Ramos to lose. And I think that we all thought that he did lose it when they brought Barra up. But I, I'm glad to see that he's now fighting for that position again. And that's what you want to see out of a goalie, a guy that's resilient. Yeah. And competition is always a good thing, because you're going to get the best results possible, period. So Exactly. I think he probably knew that Joey McDonald was a backup and was not really in the starting job. So yeah, having another kid who the Flames saw as a potential starter really, I think, made that competition that much harder. Yeah. So four-game win streak now. I can't remember the last time that we've been on a four-game win streak with this Flames team. Feels pretty good. Yeah. Well, it figures I've been sick the last couple of weeks and I haven't gone to any of the games this week and, you know, win all four, so... So you're going to the next game, right? You're going to the uh, game on Saturday. Yep. So if we lose that, that means that you have to cancel your season tickets, right? Well, I'm not going <laughs> that far, but, you know... All right. <laughs> So, so maybe we can maybe we can blame the last couple of years' woes on your attendance. We'll see. I I think it's really good to see that these guys are picking it up, and not just the goalies playing well, but it looks like you know all the all the different units, every line is playing better. Um, they seem to be more in sync tonight. It seemed like all the lines really knew everyone who was on the ice and knew their tendencies, and they were just playing like a cohesive unit for once. And I think you can put that solely on the return of Chris Russell, actually. Yeah? He has really come in and helped solidify the transition game that we've had. And, you know, we've seen a lot more offensive chances because we are more able to get the puck up the ice. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I also think that... um... Some of the just some of the line moves and stuff, they've kept consistent lines, I think, for three or four games now, and Hartley was shuffling them around for a while there. So I think that even just having the consistent lines for a while has helped these guys know who's on the ice and know how those guys are going to play. Yeah, it's all good. Speaking of Hartley, um, we we talked a couple weeks ago about our kind of mid season review of the roster. How do you think the coaching staff's doing so far at the midpoint? Just over the midpoint, I guess. This is exactly the type of coaching staff that a young team needs. You know, like, if you don't get good habits put in place 
like with hard work and such, you know, that will impact how you play five, ten years down the road. And, you know, having Hartley make them bust their ass in practice every time, you know, like that, it helps to reinforce good habits and you're seeing that on the ice where they're playing a very tenacious game even though they don't have necessarily have the amount of talent that other teams do yeah i mean this is a this is a rebuild and part of a rebuild is a learning year and i think that we can definitely say that there's some learning going on we're seeing guys i mean even lance boma tonight i think that's probably the best game i've seen from lance boma so i think we can definitely say that the players on this team are learning Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, you just have to look up north where the practices aren't as intense and it's a lot more lackadaisical, you know, and, you know, you see where Edmonton is right now and all the struggles that they have. So, you know, like, it's a good countermeasure, you know, to see... If you're not doing A, this is what you get. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And, you know, I mean, a lot of people forget this, but Bob Hartley has a Stanley Cup ring. He's coached in this league. He's had success in this league. So he knows what it takes to have success here. And every time I hear him talk, I like what I hear from him. He, you know, he talks about how, well, today we had a fun practice, or today the guys had to work hard. Like, he's really trying to balance that fun with the hard work, which is really what's going to motivate a team and get them working for you. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, like, literally, there, there is no better coaching staff, that, in my mind, for this team right now than the one that we have. Yeah, if, if you asked me two years ago to put together the coaching staff that I thought would lead this team through the rebuild or be the right one, I'll admit this would not be the coaching staff and the names I would have put forward. But you have to give credit to the organization for putting these guys in place, because I agree with you. I think this is the right coaching staff for the rebuild. And that's all Jay Feaster, so you can give credit to Jay Feaster for putting this staff together. And I, Brian Burke was on Fan 960 this week, and he talked about that too. And he said that even when he fired Feaster, he said that he likes the coaching staff and what they're doing, he doesn't think that we'll see them going anywhere anytime soon. So I think that's a positive. Yeah. And plus, you also have to look at, like, with Edmonton, they've also changed the coaching staffs over and over and over and over again. And, like, that also is hard on the players because they're not getting a consistent message. So, you know, it, keeping Hartley for, like, the next two or three years might not be a bad idea just to have that constancy of, yeah, well, but even we were doing that for a while. I mean, there was a point there where we went through, what, three coaches in five years or something like that? So, yeah, I'm glad that we've got somebody that I think the organization's finally happy with. I was glad to see that Hartley didn't leave when Feaster left because Feaster brought Hartley in as his buddy. So, yeah, I think Hartley's the right guy for this, and I, I think that the staff he's put in place is doing a great job. So I think the big Flames roster move this week um, was Shane O'Brien being waived and nobody claiming him, so he got sent to Abbotsford. Were you surprised when that happened? Not particularly. Like, with each of uh, Butler, Smith, and O'Brien, on a normal team, they're all seventh defensemen. So, you know... With having Russell come back, you're, you know, like, you can't carry that many defensemen. So, you know, getting rid of one makes sense. And, you know, they felt that O'Brien was the one that was most expendable. And, you know, they moved him down. Mm -hmm. I guess I was just kind of surprised by it because... He is a, a seasoned NHL, or I thought somebody would perhaps take him on waivers, especially this late in the season when he's not going to cost you a lot for this year. And also because of his contract, I was surprised that they were going to send him down to the AHL. He's making, what, $2 million a year? Yeah. Well, it's one of those things that you don't know what's going on necessarily in the dressing room. Like, he might not have fit in well personality wise I don't know 
you know, like, there might be more behind it than what's on the surface. Yeah. I have no idea. Do you think it's probably fair to say at this point that he's probably on the flame shopping list? Oh, yeah. He's, I honestly would doubt if he's ever going to play in a Flames jersey again. The only way I could see him coming back was if we had a rash of defensemen get hurt. Yeah. And they wanted to bring him back up because, I mean, he you know he has played most of the year here. Oh, yeah. If, he, if we run into injuries, of course, you bring up whomever. But, you know, barring that, I don't see him returning. No. And I, I could very well see him being a compliance buyout in the offseason if, if nobody takes yeah. him at the deadline. Him and David Jones. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, uh, Jones, I mean, you know, it's nice, and we talked about this the past couple of weeks, um, but it's nice that we have the cap room that we do to make those yeah. kind of buyouts and get rid of contracts that perhaps we don't want right now. So, yeah, that, that's that's quite a, a nice place for the Flames to be in, to say, okay, we have this bad deal. We don't have to ride it out. We can get rid of it and move on from it. Um, I know that you said you ha- you didn't hear the Brian Burke interview on Fan 960, but he went on Fan 960 um, and talked to the guys there right after the O'Brien thing happened, right after they sent him down. And it was nice that it was audio only, so we didn't have to see a stupid haircut this time, like we did, or lack of haircut, I guess, like when he did the Feaster press conference. Um, but I thought what, some of the interesting things that he was saying there, one of them was that we're not going to see a GM probably until at least the end of the season, probably not till after the draft. To me, that makes sense, because if you look at how long um, he said that he needed to get acquainted with his team, remember he said that he needed, what, six months or something before he was comfortable firing Feaster and getting acquainted with this roster. So you really don't want another guy coming in, you know, two months before the draft and then having a draft for this team. But, and I didn't know this, I guess in the current NHL system, you cannot give compensation to another organization to talk to someone on staff. So we can't compensate another organization to talk to their assistant general managers or scouts or anything like that. Where in the past you could, you could either give them money or draft picks or something like that. So that's going to make it a lot harder too. But that tells me the guy that he wants is somebody that's employed somewhere. Yeah. Um, realistically, you know, you need to have the summer s- session like where like they were at Windsport and all that in order to get to know exactly what type of guys that like Poirier and all that are. So, you know, you need a lead-in time for that. And, you know, having a GM come in right away, like, that's not beneficial to either him, the Flames, or any of the prospects that we have. So, you know, you basically need to start when, like, the season's over and, like, you're prepping for next year. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I think you'd probably you'd probably agree with this. Tell me if you don't. But I think with most interim GMs, I would be worried about an interim GM going to the draft table in what could be the most crucial Flames draft in a long time. But with Brian Burke as that interim GM, I feel quite comfortable with it. I think that Burke has all the tools and all the knowledge and, you know, all the connections around the league he needs to, to keep this team in good hands until he hires somebody to replace Feaster. Yeah, exactly. You know, like, while I'm not a fan of Burke's draft record in the past, you know, he hasn't, you know, I trust him rather than somebody walking on the job that doesn't necessarily have the experience yet. Yeah. And, you know, I I was actually doing some research into it because I I seem to remember after talking to a friend of mine and he mentioned, you know, Brian Burke always trades for conditional draft picks. And I went and looked back and... I haven't done extensive research, but from what I can see, it looks like, especially this time of year, Brian Burke loves to make conditional draft pick deals. So it'll be interesting to see if he continues that while he's here in Calgary. As long as we get more draft picks, then, you know, that'd be good. Yeah. But no, I agree with you. I think that uh, O'Brien will be on the way out, and I bet we'll probably end up trading him for a lower round draft pick as well. So with the with the Flames where they're at, um, I mean, they've beat a couple big teams already. They've beat the Chicago Blackhawks, and they beat the, um, tonight, the San Jose Sharks, and I guess even the Predators aren't a slouch this year. Yeah, or the Coyotes. They've all been decent. 
So do you think that this is one of those things, and we see this from time to time, where teams are underestimating uh, the Flames, and so they're able to you know, get wins over those teams? Or do you think that the Flames legitimately have something going here that they can continue on with? I think what it is is that we're playing backups, and like our team is too good for backup caliber goalies. But, you know, if we were facing the other team's starters, I don't think we would have got four wins. I think we might get two, if that. So, you know, you also have to view the other team and what they're doing. And, you know, like, Staylock is not really an NHL goaltender. No, I and, agree with that. And Anti Ranta, he's marginal at best. So, and we've seen Dubnik with Edmonton. So, you know, like... I think, too, the fact that they've been at home for all four games, and there's been quite a few breaks between them. There's been at least a day between each game. In some cases, three days between the Nashville game and the Chicago game has probably helped a lot, too. Oh, yeah. Like, that's not to take anything away from their efforts. They've done a very good job. It's just that, you know, like if they were facing the A team, so to speak, I don't think that they would have done as good but you know it's still encouraging yeah no i totally agree with you and um we've got minnesota on saturday at home and then we have montreal tuesday the islanders thursday and the flyers on a week from saturday you think that they'll be able to keep that success going i don't think they're going to go seven and oh but what do you think how do you think they'll do in the next four games uh i think two and two might be optimistic you know, we are rebuilding after all. Like, there's only so many wins in a row you can get before, you know. Before things just kind of crumble. Yeah, exactly. Like, it, we're not a playoff caliber team, so, you know. And I think even if we were to keep getting wins, let's say we don't win every game, but let's say we win, you know, every other or we get, you know, one and lose two. Before too long here, we're going to have a lot of these key pieces shipped out as well. I mean, you know, we're within a couple weeks of the trade deadline. So I think now is the time to start racking up these wins. It makes our players look better coming into the trade deadline. So I'm glad to see that. And I think that, um, I think this is, you know, even if we were to get going from here on in, there's not going to be much that we can do simply because we're going to start moving a lot of these big pieces. Yeah. Well, like, especially the guys like Camilleri and Stempniak. Like, if you're moving guys like them, those guys out, you know, like, we're not, we don't have anybody that's really ready on the farm to come up and replace them at their level right now. So, you know, it make, it'll make it make it a little more difficult to get offense, but... Yeah, but it may also mean that some of the guys in the NHL team who perhaps haven't had a, a good showing so far, like a David Jones or TJ Galliardi may end up getting more ice time, and we might get to see something out of them that we haven't seen so far. True. So, yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about the deadline when we get there, but I think that now is the time to get on this kind of a streak because it's going to make our guys look more valuable going forward. Mm-hmm. And there's seven days now between the, now and the Olympic uh, roster freeze, so... You know, if we're going to make any trades, we might make a couple beforehand. Well, there was a report that came out today from Scott Cruikshank who said that I believe there were six teams who had scouts at our game tonight. So do you think that having six teams with scouts at the game means that there's probably pieces in play, or do you think it's just this time of year you t- you send your scouts out to watch other teams? I think it's more that you know, let's see what Calgary has uh, in terms of players that we could use and, you know, see if there's anything there there worth getting, Yeah, at least. Um, it, you know. When I heard that, I thought that the GMs were probably already talking and then you'd send your scouts out and say, okay, I want you to look at these two or three guys and let me know if they're worth acquiring. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, you just have to wait and see. But you you think it's, and I think it is, do you think it's very possible that we will see at least one of our big moves happen in the next week before the Olympic break? I would be somewhat surprised if we went into the Olympics with the roster we have. Yeah, I agree with you. I think something has to happen. And 
Burke talked about that on the radio when he was with the Fan 960 guys. And they were saying to him, like, do you want to get the deals done early just so you don't have to pay a premium at the deadline? And he pretty much said, this time of year, you're going to pay a premium anyways. You sometimes pay a premium just to get the deal done early. So he's not too worried about doing the deal early or right on the deadline and paying a premium. But yeah, I, I really think that you'll see deals get done at least one before the break. If I was bringing in a big player like Mike Camilleri, I'd want to bring them in before the break so that I can have them watching tape and working with my team over that break. Yeah, exactly. With a more impact player, like I could even possibly see Dennis Weidman moving. So, you know, in either case, it's one of those situations where the more lead-in time that you have with the player, the better. Yeah. And then with a bunch of the NHL brass in Sochi together, even though there's a trade freeze on, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a bunch of paperwork completed and faxed in the moment the league office reopens after the Olympics. So I think we'll see yeah. definitely something happen right before the Olympics and probably something the day that it reopens. Yeah. Like, I I don't see, you know, like, I see more, like, if big names are going to go, I think it's going to be before the break. And then you'll see the lower line depth guys be the more likely candidates to move after the break. Your O'Briens, your McDonald's, those kind of guys. This team's trying yeah. to fill holes that they left yeah, after like, they made a trade. Like the Blake Como trade last year, like just that kind of just roster filler type moves. Well, and if you look back at the deadline, as we get late in the day on the deadline, we tend to see those. We tend to see teams going, okay, I just moved out a left winger. So now I need to go out and acquire one for cheap. And so that's where I think, yeah, people could knock on our door and say, hey, you've got a depth, like you said, a depth defenseman and somebody like a butler, or you've got a depth winger. Can we take them off your hands just because we have to fill a hole? Yeah, and, you know, realistically with the depth that we have on the farm, you know, we can easily get by if we move out five or six players even. So, you know. It's just, it depends on who, what, where, and why. Speaking of farm depth, um, did you see the weird trade that the Flames made, the AHL trade? I don't even know how this works, but the Flames moved Mark Kandari to the Chicago Wolves for Corey Locke. But yet, Kandari is still under um, Flames contract, and Locke is not under Flames contract, so... I don't really know how that works. To me, that's just a loan. It's not really a trade. Like, we just loan them a player and they loan us a player. It just seems like a... Yeah, that's basically, in effect, what it is. But, you know, usually when you deal a player like that, you know, like, you can technically recall them, but usually you don't just because, like, that's a bit of a dick move. Now, with Mark Kandari, I mean, he was a, a defenseman that I think a lot of people spoke highly of that came over in the Bowmeister deal. Do you think the fact that he's now been traded to Chicago is spelling the end of him for the Flames organization? Do you think that's the Flames saying that they've given up on him? Not necessarily 100%, but I could see it because of the fact that you got guys like Kalkin and Kulak and Sealoff all being ready for the AHL next year in addition to Watherspoon and guys like uh, Breen and that. So, you know, like... Yeah, I mean, if you look at if you look at the current defensive lineup in Abbotsford, they've got Brady Lamb, Chad Billings, Derek Smith, John Ramage, Patrick Selov, and now Shane O'Brien and Tyler Watherspoon. So it's a, it's a tough back end to crack a spot in. So maybe they even just did it just saying, okay, we had to move somebody because we want them to play. And in that case, maybe it's not that he's necessarily being banished. It's just, hey, you can go over here and actually play. Yeah, and plus with us recalling Jones and Street, you know, like that was our two primary scorers on Abbotsford. So, you know, we did need to get somebody to replace their input. You know, I know Jones has gone back now, but... At least now we have more options. So, you know, like I think Abbotsford is trying to go for the Calder Cup this year. And this so. Corey Locke guy is not signed to any NHL deal. So I could see perhaps Abbotsford trying to evaluate him and see if they want to sign him to a, an AHL deal next year 
or perhaps the Flames wanting to sign him and put him down there. So it might just be a win-win of, hey, yeah, we'll move Kandari, we'll give him some ice time, and in, in return we'll bring in a centerman who we get to evaluate. Exactly. And, you know, worst case scenario is you get somebody for the remainder of the year to chip in some goals for Abby, so... And we've seen the Flames do that in the past. Like, there's that guy, I forget who even gave up for him, but last year they brought in that Mike Tesswede guy who just stayed here for the rest of the year and then they got rid of. I think it was uh, Mitch Wall that we gave up for that. I'm just looking at this Corey Lock guy. He's five foot nine, 175 pounds, and he's 29 years old. So knowing he's 29, I doubt the Flames have much of an interest in signing him long term. It probably is just injury replacement and depth going forward if they are running for the Calder Cup. Yeah, and that's good too. Yeah, like it. I would much rather Abbotsford be a winning team, not just a team with ringers, though. Like you, you're seeing guys like Granlund and Knight and all that being key contributors. So like that's good. Yeah, and and I think you have to have that if you want to be a winning team, just like we see in the NHL. You'll pick up weird guys for depth you know, at the deadline just because you want the depth. And so maybe that's what the Flames are trying to do in the A is just say, hey, this guy has some experience. Let's pick him up. Let's bring him on the roster. And if we never play him, we never play him. But at least we've got him if we need him. Yeah. There's no upper roster size in the AHL, I don't think. You can have as many guys on the roster as you want, I believe. I have no clue. And speaking of roster size, I know in the NHL there used to be a thing, I don't know if it was before the deadline or after, but at some point in the league uh, season where you could only have a maximum number of recalls at some point. Is that right, after the deadline? Yeah, yeah after the deadline you're only allowed four recalls. So would you be surprised to see the Flames recall all of their guys all at once? Well, that's why I think you're you're going to see us making trades prior to the deadline, just so that way... We can recall the necessary players to replace them without using up any of those four replacements. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you know, I think that having four replacements, I mean, we're not going to have a lot of games after the deadline. So I think, yeah, any players we trade, especially big players, we're probably not getting a roster piece back. So bringing those four guys up, I don't know how it works, but I imagine if we bring them up on the deadline day before the deadline, they don't count. So we might technically yeah. be able to bring like eight guys up, depending on how many guys we move and when. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm just looking through the Abbotsford roster here. There's a lot of people I kind of forgot that the Flames actually had playing in the AHL this year, like Ben Hanowski yeah. is there. So there's a lot of guys that I could see the Flames at least bringing up, saying, okay, we've moved out a guy like um, Camilleri or somebody like that and bringing up just to give them a shot. And these guys will still not have to clear waivers if we want to send them down in the off season. Exactly. And, you know, realistically with guys like Reinhardt, Hanowski, and Knight, you know, those are the guys that are likely going to be the first recalls just because of the fact that they're the older prospects that we have on the heat and that way you you know because there's a lot less time to determine what they are versus you know guys that are going to be coming up next year like grand or Gaudreau and poirier and all that so you know and I, makes a, yeah and i think one guy we'll definitely see back up here is berchi who's also been sent down i think like you said to give them some scoring depth but i think he'll be brought back up before too long as well I I would actually prefer to see him down there the remainder of the year, just for constancy. You know, just get your game together and don't worry about coming up and yeah. You know. Yeah. Well, and we have a good teaching coach down there in Troy Ward, so you're right. It probably couldn't hurt to have him down there working with Troy for a little bit longer. It's not like we need him here. It's not like you know we're gonna lose games without him, and that's gonna be. Um, you know, a detriment to our team. We're going to lose either way. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that we need to make moves to, that are for the benefit of the player, not necessarily the benefit of the Flames team at the moment. So, you know, like if that means that you got Berchi down there for the remainder of the year and, you know, telling him to work hard in the off season for next year and that's the best thing for him, fine, go for it. You know, yeah. and 
I'm like that. I have that same opinion with any of our players. Just whatever is best for them. Because, you know, I'd like to see them develop these players properly and we have you know, we have to at this point yeah because i don't want to see us go into like a 10-year spiral like edmonton so <laughs> no nobody wants that we were just talking about the players that they'll probably bring up because of their age um another guy that i even forgot was here was lane mcdermott who's 24 so they i don't think he played like one or two games on the main roster this year i think so they'll probably bring him up. I can see that being one of the first call-ups just to see what they've got in him. He's a big boy. They want size going forward. And you said that, to, speaking of size, you said that today Burke mentioned that he was going to be looking for size at the draft table this year? Yeah. Um, in He was saying that he's not going to be taking any small players at the draft this year, which is a good thing. Uh, you know, like... I, it's misunderstood at times, like when you're saying that, oh, well, we need to get size in the organization and truculence. Like, people take that as, like, we're just going to have a bunch of goons, and that's not necessarily correct. It's like if you got two players that are more or less equivalent, and say one six feet and the other guy's six two, you know, and all the rest of their game is relatively the same will go with the bigger guy just because you know you look at guys like teams like LA San Jose Anaheim you know like their teams are all filled with big players and you know like it's harder in the playoffs to play against them and especially with how the playoffs are set up now where you're playing division rivals you know, you have to fight through those types of teams. And, you know, like when you watched Montreal play Ottawa last year, Montreal was by far the superior team, but all their players were short. And Ottawa bounced them really without much difficulty, even though they were quite terrible and themselves got bounced by Pittsburgh the very next series. So... You know, well, like I think in, in most sports, size is an attribute. So, yeah, if you're measuring players and you're looking at two guys are tied, you take the guy who has some sort of a, an advantage, and size is an advantage. I don't think that means that we're going to go out and just find the biggest dudes we can find in the draft and draft off the table because of it. But like you said, you're going to look at the guys and you'll take a guy within you know three or four spots of where you're supposed to be who has good size. Yeah, like it, it's not like you're just going to pick like all Kanzigs. Just because, oh, they're big. You know, like, you'd have to be really, 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 really stupid if you're approaching the draft that way. Like, just grab you know, the list you, and sort them by height. Yeah, like, you should just fire yourself right there and then, you know, like, like you could get a better chance of hitting the target if you just threw random darts at the board. But, you know, like... Yeah, no, it, it's yeah, your, it's one more attribute, and it's one more thing that you look at. And like you said, if there's a guy you say 5'10", and a guy who's 6'3", and you have them rated within a couple points of each other, you draft the guy who's 6'3", just because it's one of those intangibles. Yeah, well, like, realistically, if you look at a contending team, like, you can get away with one or two small forwards. Like, Chicago has Patrick Kane. You know, like... You can't really have too many below average height guys. Otherwise, you get pushed around a little too easily. You know, so like if Gaudreau pans out and becomes a top six forward for us, well, you know, it makes Berchi's chance of sticking harder. And then if you get anybody else, like, you know, it, they're, you're just creating a team full of little people, and that's not good when you have to actually go into the playoffs yeah so you know and it's, I mean, it's and it's good i guess i was happy when you told me that because i'm glad they're identifying this now this is the time that we have to be rebuilding and we have to be figuring out what we want and i'm glad the flames are identifying that that right or wrong this is the decision they i think it's the right decision but right or wrong this is the decision they are going to go with they have a plan and I think that's going to shape how they rebuild and who they bring in as staff and that sort of thing. So I'm glad they're identifying that now instead of three years in going, oh, crap, we haven't been drafting the way we wanted to. Um, yeah, now we're screwed. Yeah. 
Well, like, especially, like, if you look at our defense core, like, it, top to bottom, other than Dennis Weidman, who does not play at his height, you know, like, all of our defensemen are, like, six feet, six one. You know, and, like, that's fine. It's just that y you need a couple of bigger guys, you know, like, six three, six four, just to be able to push bodies, you know, and we don't really have that. And it makes it a lot more difficult, you know, on the whole, just because, you know, like, you look at Brody and Russell, and while they're both very good offensive defensemen, they're both very slight in their frame, you know, and you get a guy like, say, Joe Thornton leaning on them, you know, it's not going to take much for the bigger guy to overpower them, so... Well, if you yeah. look at if you look at the roster moves they've made so far, I mean, they brought in Smead halfway through the year, and he's six three, so there's a big guy. And then of all the defensemen on the farm, the flame or the player that the Flames brought up after sending down O'Brien was uh, Breen, who's six foot seven. So they're definitely yeah. they're definitely going for that. Get try to get you know even if it's at one piece at a time, try to get that bigger core on the ice and that's not really saying that Breen's a long-term piece no but, you know but even and again even on the forward side I mean there's a lot of guys that I was surprised didn't get called up earlier this year but you know you look at guys like Blair Jones who's six foot two perhaps he got the call just because he's a big boy yeah and like that's why I wouldn't be surprised if Lane McDermott gets called up and you know Guys like that, just... Uh, McDermott is 6'4", um, Corbin Knight is 6'2", start calling up our bigger guys, Michael Furland is 6'2", Hanowski's 6'3", so, you know, like, you need more of that, not, you know, shorter people, yeah. so... But, uh, yeah, and you're right, You w there's always going to be a place for shorter guys, and I think someone like Yari Hoodler, who's six ten, who's, sorry, 5'10", I don't think any of us would deny that he's a bona fide NHLer. Oh, no. It's just that you can't have Hoodler, Camilleri, Berchi, Paul Byron, and Gaudreau and expect to actually go anywhere. Yeah, exactly. So there's there's that mix you need. Westgarth is a six foot four. So, again, a mid-season yeah. acquisition, and they brought in big guys. So yeah, Smeed, and we Kevin do Westgarth. need that a lot more. It's just, you know, we need our younger players, like... You look at Monahan, he's 6'2 or 6'3. Poirier, he's 6'2. Jankowski's 6'4. So, you know, like we're starting to get there. And even guys like Tim Harrison is 6'3. So, you know, like we're starting to address it. It's just it's not quite there yet. But that's why we're in a rebuild. I mean, if it was there, we wouldn't be in a rebuild. Yeah. Exactly. Right? We're expecting this to be a. a process that will take some time hopefully not as long as edmonton but it's a process that we expect to take a couple yeah. years well like, it, exactly like if you're expecting the playoffs before 2017 you're a little bit naive i think but you know it's just the nature of things we're just you know you're one of the rebuilds mm -hmm. so and you know for year one i think that they're doing pretty good Oh, yeah. They're doing absolutely fantastic for year one. I'll be honest, they're doing better than I expected with the rebuild and the roster and that sort of thing so far this year. Yeah. Like, when they were really bad in the end of December-ish, like, that was more the type of team I was expecting all year. Right after so, Christmas? Yeah, yeah. Like, that dreadful period where, like, they couldn't score at all. That was more what I was anticipating Mm -hmm. But all year, not, you know, the team that we've been seeing at the beginning of the year or recently. Yeah. So, it's good. An another one of the acquisitions that's been brought in um, since Brian Burke has been here, not necessarily as acting GM, but Joel Colborn, 6'5". So, everyone that Burke has brought in since he's been here has been a big guy. Yeah, and we need that, you know, like... You just have to look at L.A. where they got guys like Kopitar and Brown and, you know, on and on and on where they're all like 6'4", six, 6'5", six, pretty much. Like, it, you know, it, it's hard to play against teams like that, especially in a physical playoff series because size will usually beat out skill if 
you know, in a playoff series, so not necessarily a playoff run, but, you know, yeah. if it's close, it you know, usually the bigger team will just push the little team off to the side and yeah. carry the play. We have a lot of big boys in our team, but I'm also noticing, just looking at the roster, a lot of Canadian boys in our team. And I said this before, they're not a Western Canadian, but it almost feels like they're following that Daryl Sutter, big Western Canadian style team. That was always Daryl's thing, is get them big and get them mean. Well, the thing is, is that Sutter didn't necessarily have it completely wrong. It's just that you also need to inject skill into that, and that's where I think Sutter got it a little wrong so you know like if if he had instead of using picks like on Chucko and Pellick and Irving and used it on the offensively skilled forward I think they would have been better off but you know that's you know 10 years ago yeah so, and what's oh done well. is done and now we're in the rebuild and we're making the right decisions which is what we want to be seeing we're not sitting here questioning the decisions that our team is making like our friends up north. Not nearly the gong show that's up there. Exactly. Well, Matt, I think um, I'm riding the high on this game. I think I'm going to be excited to see what happens Saturday. Anything else you want to talk about tonight? No, I'm good. I'm glad you're feeling better. You're sounding yeah. better. I actually have my voice for the first time in three days, so that's good. I think that's probably it for us for this week. And uh, we will talk to everybody again next week with hopefully a couple more Flames wins that we'll be talking about. Yeah. Have a great week, Matt. Yeah, take care, everyone. We are the boys of chorus. We hope you like our show. We know you're rooting for us, but now we have to go. Fireside Chat Podcast, produced and edited by Dan Stevenson.